So anyway, and now I'd like to turn to Pat Rivard and Paul Hurley, who are going to show us how they build foreground trees. So uh, Pat, Paul, welcome. Thank you, Jim. Paul, are you ready? I certainly am. I'm bringing it up now. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, at this hour of the evening and uh, with about uh, 40 plus people still online, clearly a committee of the willing and the interested. Uh, we've got about a 40 minute presentation for you. Uh, we'll make it as crisp as possible. Uh, clearly it's about tree building. Pat and I uh, both have layouts. Uh, Pat models in O scale, uh, I model in HO. So the techniques we're going to be sharing with you this evening uh, are uh, very much uh, workable in different sizes. And we'll talk about some of the changes that you might make, depending on the scale of what you're involved in. Um, one of the things that uh, is clearly our bottom line message is uh, we look to nature. Um, we think that it's important as modelers that we uh, observe, learn to see with our eyes in detail, and uh, what we can't remember, we capture in photographs. So we're going to be looking at some pictures starting off that uh, Pat has taken. Um, I don't think there are any from me on trips to British Columbia. That's the area that Pat's primarily modeling. So here's a, a very typical scene that you'll see in the Canadian Rockies, but would work in certainly Washington and Oregon states as well. Um, so lots of variety of species that you can see here. Note the branch structure. Notice, for example, this tree on the left, how there's truncated branches, branches that have few or no needles. Um, notice the lean on the tree. So that's something to take away when we get down to the detail aspect of building up a tree structure. Um, notice the tenacity of trees. Um, these ones are growing literally out of the side of a solid granite wall, rock wall in a canyon uh, or in a, a valley that's been carved by a river. Um, coniferous trees in particular follow moss uh, as a way of breaking down rocks. So you'll find them in all sorts of uh, hardy and uh, arduous uh, environments. Um, here's another one probably down the same canyon or river valley, uh, getting lots of moisture, but also getting a lot of pummeling by the elements. But again, we want to look at uh, the, the nature of the trees themselves. Notice the small ones here on the right. Threw in this picture of uh, just a tree trunk to make an important point. I can't speak for anyone else still on the call, but uh, when I was drawing trees, for whatever reason, uh, in primary school, maybe even preschool, I was always coloring them brown. But in fact, trees are seldom brown in color. And this show, shot in particular shows the silver gray uh, hue of the uh, outer bark. Notice as well, uh, these will be uh, not uh, on the inner boards if this was cut down, but this is where some of those dying branches, such as this one above here, have fallen off. And notice as well, that can capture this in a larger scale. It doesn't really show up in HO that well, but you'll tend to get on a fresh hole in the side of the tree before it closes in, sap that will ooze out down the side. And in a lot of cases, when you look closely at a lot of trees, this may be an example up here where my cursor is, that uh, bits of dirt and other debris that are flying about in the air will stick to that pine sap as they make their way down the side of the tree. So again, we look to nature uh, and uh, nature of course is gonna vary depending on the area that you model. This is a series of two shots, and we'll return to Pat's layout later in this presentation, but here is a, a cliff and valley scene that Pat has been building. Notice again, the variety of the trees, the tr variety of the sizes, um, as well, there are some deciduous trees, probably um, a poplar, uh, this is a fall shot, obviously, um, that are mixed in among them. And again, uh, typical of what you'll see in parts of British Columbia. 
another close-up shot. We'll return to this one later to talk about uh, detailing on the ground. But again, just notice the wide range of uh, uh, branch structure, uh, species that are represented here. And then you have uh, various other little bits and bobs of debris and plant matter that are along the front to uh, hide the tree line and to help balance or blend the, the um, trees into the rock structure. So where do you get the research? Well, of course you can uh, do road trips, but that isn't always possible uh, in extreme situations. We're familiar with people in uh, Europe that uh, model parts of North America. So if you go into Google uh, images, um, you can use the term uh, silhouettes for trees. Uh, this is just some of what will come up. And I find these really very helpful uh, because you'll notice very, very quickly when you look at them, they're all coniferous trees, but there are so many different species. And even over here in the pines, just notice the, the different branch structure. Notice the angle that the branches come off of the tree. Notice in this particular one, and we'll see this later uh, when we start showing you uh, how we build up certain trees, uh, the branches at the top point upward and then they begin to droop in this particular species as they go down. Notice the needle structure here in this particular pine. Um, almost looks like a brain shot from above. So the, lots of variety in nature. Um, so you want to be aware of what uh, species of, in this case, uh, coniferous trees grow in the area that you're modeling. You want to find out uh, where they might be. Usually it's on poor ground, but that can vary uh, from location to location. Here again, some uh, trees uh, mainly from Europe. And Pat, we'll turn things over to you to Thank start you, through the how-to steps. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to point out some of the tools here that we use. Uh, we'll start from left to right. Um, there's uh, sandpaper. I like to use fine sandpaper. Uh, there's a reciprocal saw blade. I use that for graining. Then next I have a, a, a replaceable break off type bladed knife. And it's handy because you don't want to have a sharp edge at all times when you're working with this stuff. Uh, the next one is your sponge sand type sandpaper, good old dollar store stuff, nothing expensive, coarse on one side, fine on the other. Then next to that, we have the brush. That's to clean up your mess that you sometimes will leave when you start carving. Then there's your two brushes. I like to use a fan brush that's fairly stiff, well used. And next to that is a yellow handled one. It's a soft brush that's used for painting and adding certain things afterwards. That little tool right there is my graining tool. And I'll explain to you later what that is. Uh, quite interesting. I came across that by accident. The uh, container, I should say to the container at the top, we, we should point that out. That's the stain that we're going to use. That's just strictly black latex paint with a little bit of red, reddish brown paint mixed in with it to give it some tone. Uh, it's up to the individual as to what he wants to use. Uh, on the right hand side, you'll see what I'm using there for the for the trunks, it's the balsa wood. And we'll explain why I use balsa as we move into the uh, making of the uh, trunks. Next. Um, we're going to go through six stages. And the first stage will be uh, the, the type of wood is raw balsa. I buy it in squares, uh, ranging in different thicknesses from half inch on up. And then we're going to go through the shaping of the raw wood. As you can see what's happening there in two, stage two. And then stage three, we'll be adding the grain detail. That's the fourth one over. That's got the grain detail in it. Uh, and then the sanding of it. Then there'll be the painting, which will be kind of nice, messy if you don't watch what you're doing. Uh, you want to have plenty of prote protection down below. And then the placing of the branches. So we'll move on. 
Here is the raw balsa. I usually use half inch square, maybe larger, depending on how much of how big of a trunk I, I want to make. Um, it's good for old scale. The three eighths inch one can be used uh, for HO. Um, and you can use smaller, some use skewer sticks. And then you can go smaller for end scale. I haven't built one of those. I don't know what it's like to build an end scale in that type of tree, but I'm sure that there, there's a lot of good modelers out there that could do it. We hope we can help you do it. Next. I was going to say, Pat, in addition to skewers with the smaller scale that I work in, uh, sometimes I use a dowel. Um, I have a, a fairly inexpensive source at a, um, uh, oddly enough, uh, sort of like a dollar store in our area. That's a good source. <laughs> okay, stage two, uh, shaping the raw wood. Um, I usually like to start about uh, placing the, the wood down on a flat surface and then moving the knife away from you. <laughs> give, give you two reasons why you should. <laughs> and then uh, I moved the knife away from me and I carved the, uh, the bulk of the wood off, not a lot of it, but some of it, just to get it a bit, a bit of a shape to it. I don't try to make it round. It's impossible. You want to make it down to sort of a point, but not too much of a point. Um, and you want to leave the bottom as thick as possible. I usually start about two or three inches up, and I'll show you why later. Okay, go ahead, Bo. You were mentioning the importance of carving away uh, while you're on that topic. What uh, brand of Band-Aid do you recommend? <laughs> <laughs> the biggest possible. If you slip with that knife, you're going to need it. <laughs> no fooling, eh? Oh, man. This is the wrong way to use that special tool. I, I, I want to stress that uh, because uh, this is only for showing you what you do with it. You want to place that wood on the surface and then pull that thing along the top of it away from you. Um, it makes a great uh, stress marks on the um, trunk. And um, it also has uh, a good sharp edge on it. That's actually a piece of lead with a bunch of nails that have been placed in it. And they use that particular thing with uh, flower arrangements. That's what they stick the flower stem into. Anyway, uh, another little trick I've learned that also, as everyone knows, is very soft and very easily to break. And if I break these things, I don't worry about it. I just drill a little hole, stick a toothpick in it, a hardwood toothpick, of course, and uh, push it back together with some glue and do a little more carving again or with the uh, or graining again with your tool, and you'll never even see it. I haven't been fortunate enough to find a tool like this. Uh, but something that came into my possession is a, kind of a wire floor brush. What it was originally intended for, I don't know, but it's pretty good on all but the really hardest of woods to put good grain detail in. And Pat also showed you some examples of how he uses either razor saws or reciprocating saw blades. Yeah, I think too, I need to bring that up that for that scale in HO, you want something a little uh, finer. Yeah. It, yeah, it would work better that way. Now, when you get done carving, you're going to have yourself a real mess, as you can see there. I usually take a piece of sandpaper and just lightly remove the, uh, the real roughness of it, but I don't try to make it smooth. Otherwise, you'll remove the grain pattern, and you don't want to do that. That's our stage four, and I'll move on to stage five. Oh, we're still in four. Well, what do you know? The final result of sanding will look like that. Um, you might see the odd little bit of uh, furriness to it, but I don't try to take it all out because uh, it look, looks realistic. Yeah, that can eventually represent one of those uh, dead branches that we saw in the pictures that you took in British Columbia. Yeah, yeah, you could do that, yeah. And uh, the trunk is now ready for staining. Ah, oh, here it is, stage five, staining. I usually have a, a mixture of black with that brown color in it. Uh, I go 50-50. I try to make it thin enough so that it will uh, actually soak in very well. If you use it, use it too thick, it will not soak in very well. Um, you could use burnt umber, brown, whatever. But make sure you make it thin enough to wash into the wood. And that's why I like to use balsa because balsa will absorb it a lot better. 
That's the whole thing. It'll and it also <laughs> when it dries, it'll lighten up too. Do you recommend uh, breaking down the viscosity of the water? Uh, not in this case. I don't use any detergent. I don't like to do that in this particular stuff because uh, you don't need it. You don't need to have it absorb with the, the, the soap will not make any difference. It'll still absorb into the wood very well. And never alcohol. In this particular case, yeah. Anyway, um, moving on, stage five. If you're in a hurry, use a hairdryer. If you're not, just make a bunch of them, put them on a piece of styrofoam and leave it there to dry. By the time you get, get down to your 10th or 11th one, the first one should be dry enough to work with. And you want a uniform, not a uniform color, because if you look at an actual trunk of a tree, it's not uniform in color. It has different variations in shade. Moving on. Uh, here we go with dry brushing. I think a lot of you model railroaders are all about dry brushing, but we're going to try and explain it to some of those that don't. I use um, that wide fan brush that you saw earlier, be a little bit stiff. Um, I touch it, into the, touch it into the paint, white paint, of course. And then I just take and wipe it across the grain. Do not do it with the grain or you'll fill in all the detail that you have in there now. So dry brushing, you kind of wipe out most of the paint before you do this. So it just kind of leaves a little bit of a tone across it. Um, the result of dry brushing, um, you can see right there that uh, as it, it, the tone of the wood seems to come through it a little more because that black mixed paint goes in very well. And um, it comes up showing that brown behind it. So with the white across it, it looks pretty good, I think, as you can see from the color texture. Here's a little trick that we do for simulating moss. Um, I like to use Doc O'Brien's uh, mildew green. It's like a powder almost. It is a powder. It's like a I forget what they call that uh, uh, right out the hand. It's a, uh, it's very easy to put on. You just touch your brush in a little bit and you put a, uh, a little bit of ma uh, lat Maytag or uh, the glue on there and you just drop that mildew green on a little bit and it turns out to look just like a piece of uh, moss growing up the tree. Um, and I like to apply more of it at the bottom of the tree uh, with and then use poly fiber and stuff like that, ground foam. It's whatever you want to use at the bottom to make it a little more pronounced. Moving on. One of the uh, sort of hot topics for the last year or so uh, has been modeling or weathering with pan pastels. Um, any experience, any comment from your side on using a, a green pan pastel to simulate moss? I don't know if Doc O'Brien's. Uh, if you call this a pan pastel or not, I'm not very sure of that, but I'm sure we'll find out at the end. Well, pan um, pastel is a brand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right too. No, I've never used it itself. Okay. Um, the finished bark, you can see it there with a little bit of the moss, some of the white showing through the wood and the black is, is dulled down because it's dried up and it, some of the woods come through the color of the wood. Um, and uh, you plant your tree. Some say you should face it to the north side. Well, <laughs> most layouts have a lot of curves and bends and everything else. Uh, in real life, I would say that's right. But I would like, yeah, yeah. you want to put the tree in the best position possible that most of the detail is shown to the face of the layout. That's what I think anyway. But somebody else may, may differ. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so now that we've uh, finished the trunk of the tree, uh, essentially now we have an armature that we can start to build the tree structure. So here you see uh, Pat's drilling out the bottom with a Dremel tool. Uh, in his case, he uses um, uh, skewers uh, broken off or sawed off uh, to put in the bottom. Working on a smaller scale, I tend to use small pieces of wire, sometimes small nails in the bottom. Again, this is to help hold the tree in place um, uh, 
you know, make it a lot more sturdy. Uh, there's a debate about that. Uh, I certainly am very careful about any trees that I ever put uh, near the aisleway and near the fascia. Uh, I make sure that they're just out of the way where people are going to be reaching through. But uh, these these certainly help with the planting of the tree. Um, so now we want to prepare the actual uh, branch structure. Um, one product that Pat's found works really, really well is Caspia. You can obtain it at florist shops pretty well anywhere across North America. And uh, I've got a florist, uh, actually a couple of florists in a small town near me. And uh, one is very obliging. She'll provide me with a number of floral products and order in a product like this. And these are used in arrangements to sort of fill them in. So it's not a specialty product. It's something that most florists have all the time. Uh, when you are ordering them, make sure that you uh, specifically request that there are these florets or the flowers on the end. And uh, I'm just noting where those are with my cursor. Um, certainly here you do want to get as much penetration into the um, material as possible. And so uh, adding a little bit of detergent, not too much. This is foamed up because it, the, uh, the container was given a good shake. Um, but just one or two drops is really all that you're going to need. And you'll note uh, no alcohol. Hang it to dry. Certainly if you're doing this industrial style, so you're uh, having a go and preparing as much as possible at one time. And a bit of advice, uh, you'll see an example here. If you're hanging it up to dry, make sure gentlemen that you put down several layers of newspaper. Otherwise, uh, you will rue the consequences. Yeah, I just want to step in here. I found another yep. trick too, is to lay down some wax paper and lay them on wax paper yep. and let them dry. Yep. It works pretty good. Yeah, and parchment paper would be another one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, thanks, Pat. Um, so here you see Pat sorting through the dried material um, and essentially don't throw anything out at this stage. Uh, even little bits that you have that might break off inadvertently, you're going to be able to use them in some manner, shape or form, even if they become uh, debris on the forest floor as you build it up in the foreground. Uh, in this picture in the lower right, you see uh, both uh, then an untinted and a tinted or stained version of the Caspia. So now that we um, have, we, we've got a trunk armature, we've got our prepared branches, we can actually start building out or filling out our tree. So start at the top and work down is the way that we've found most helpful. And certainly it pays to take your time. Uh, so I would stop at this point, make sure that I'm very, very clear what it is I'm gonna be building in this session. And then I look at those silhouettes, even more than pictures, but the photographs are helpful as well. And, and then try to make sure that the way that I am setting the branches, uh, drilling the holes, as you'll see in a moment, uh, are going to give me uh, some facsimile of what I'm seeing in my pictures. So here we are, we're working down the trunk armature for this particular tree. I think this was a Douglas fir that Pat was building, am I right, Pat? Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, Pat's going to go down the trunk in a spiral fashion. And it doesn't matter if you inadvertently drill through, no big deal. You've just created a hole or a blemish on the tree and no one's gonna look that closely. Anyway. Another little thing too, Paul, uh, I found that uh, when you stick those stems through, sometimes it'll go all the way through the hole and it yeah, leaves yeah. a little piece on the other side. So it looks like a, a, a broken branch or whatever. Yep, yep, yep. So there, in, in actual fact, there are, there are no mistakes. Nope. Um, just, uh, <laughs> more regularity. Uh, to simulate what we would see in nature itself. Right. Um, you'll note a little comment down here, as you saw in the silhouettes that we showed you near the outset, uh, <laughs> different coniferous trees, uh, their branches and their needle structure is quite different. And especially what you want to do is almost like an impressionist painting. It doesn't have to be precisely exact. What you want to do is, is put things together in such a way that when someone walks in, like having billboards and other things, uh, the trees will help to set uh, in the viewer's mind's eye uh, where it is that this layout is situated. Um, and, and the brain will do the rest. Uh, and just a little uh, point for those who are gonna stick with us, uh, at the very end, we're gonna offer up some resources that you can use. So here we've started the process. Um, Pat uh, got his top uh, small branches in place and is starting to work down the length of the trunk. 
use your smaller pieces at the top as you go down and work, work them out lar larger as you go. Absolutely. And as Pat said, if they poke out the other side, no big deal. You've just created a, a, a dead branch. Now here we're going to then start to fill out the needle structure. So uh, we use hairspray, uh, an inexpensive hairspray, um, and please unscented um, is an excellent product to get you a, um, a good hold without causing uh, sort of follow on uh, issues for you. So as you start to flock in this case, um, uh, dry foam or, or ground foam over your tree armature that's been sprayed, um, any of the flock that is uh, excess is gonna fall through to, in this case, a plastic tub underneath. It could be a shoe box, anything that you wanna use. We found that if you're using uh, a spray on adhesive, uh, it tends to transfer to the uh, flocking material or the ground foam. And as a result, you really can't reuse what falls out at the bottom. Hairspray seems to work great. So you can do, depending on uh, you, how you feel things look partway through, you can make uh, two and even three applications just reusing what's at the bottom and adding to it. And another thing too, Paul, I if you go back that, <clears throat> to that previous picture, yep. you want to make sure that you don't spray on an adhesive because if it goes onto the trunk mm. and you sprinkle your ground foam on there, yep. it'll stick to the trunk. And then you're going to have a heck of a time getting it off. It's much easier with the uh, hairspray and use good hairspray. Yeah, and, uh, and a stiff brush will help you to remove any of the uh, uh, ground foam like, material that yeah. does happen to adhere to the, uh, the trunk, but that's usually not that big a deal, um, uh, but you can do that. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, the tree that we've gotten this far. Um, it's, this particular one is just about ready to be planted. Uh, and from this point forward, we'll show you some other materials and some other kinds of species of conifers that we've been able to build. Pat, back to you. Okay. Here's uh, one of the trees I created. Uh, I've always wanted to do a scotch pine. And I, I, I couldn't figure out what came, my material I would use, but I did come across a new floret that was called German Scipia. And the reason why I found out it was German Scipia that I was using because I was at one of the shows one day and a woman was walking in by and she knew all these type of plants and she saw it. And I didn't know before that, but she told me what it was. And I said, yeah, thanks very much. I, I thought that was pretty good. But German Scipia is a very good uh, material. It's a lot stiffer. And when it's dry, it's brown in color. So you got your stems are already brown. And, and uh, when it's new, if you grab it the wrong way, it'll prick you. It's got little pricky things on it. So anyway, it's an interesting plant. And I use it for making the uh, scotch pine because they have the right type of way the florets go out on the end of it. And then I use ground foam and sprinkle on some flock. And as you can see, that's the result. Um, Caspia branches are easy to break. And that's why I use the German Scipia. I have a number of trees on my layout and every time I go by, I happen to hit one of my uh, Caspia trees and whoop, like you say, you lose it off in the midair somewhere and it's gone. So there you are looking for a new branch or you stick a dead one in there. So it looks like it's, <laughs> it's supposed to be there. <laughs> yeah, almost as much fun as looking for small parts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, German Scipia for my Scotch pine, you can get that at, uh, uh, any florist shop, you ask them for it, they'll, they'll get it out for you. Make sure it's got a lot of floret on it. Otherwise, you're not going to get a really good uh, surface to work with. Um, down below is a little trick I learned. I was walking through Hobby Lobby. Bad place to be. Anyway, <laughs> I walked through there and I saw this plastic fern and, and the branches looked all right, but not enough material on it. But I said to myself, well, I got enough junk at home. I can throw it on there and make it look a little better if I wanted to. So then it's made of plastic. That's what I liked about it. As clumsy as I am, if I hit it or strike it, it's not going to break. It's going to be there all the time. And if you look at some of the pictures I have, I have that in my background. But Hobby Lobby was the only source that I could find that one particular fern because I looked for it at Michael's and they didn't have it. 
but I did find Hobby Lobby has a great variety of plastic uh, plants. Now I, I get that it comes on a wire stem and I'll pull it off. And if you look where the scissors are at the very end of that plant or that plastic stem, there's a hole in that. I use that to put my little toothpick or something to plant it into the trunk. But I'll cut those off in different lengths. And uh, you'll see where the wide ones are on the right at the bottom. I usually uh, cut them on an angle so they aren't uh, all wide like that. I don't like to leave them like that because they look weird on a tree. Uniform. So, yeah. And uh, they can be glued to your trunk of the tree very easily. Uh, here's uh, hairspray again. Well, what do you know? That's pretty handy stuff. Anyway, I spray that there with the hairspray. I lie it down on a, on a flat surface and then I start sprinkling on flocking. I find a flocking fills it so it looks better. And as you Voila. see here in, in the picture B, it gives you a good idea what happens when you flock it. It's, uh, it's from the A at the beginning to B after you've done a lot of flocking and lots of spraying. And if you want, you can use ground foam at the first and then put the flocking on afterwards. It, it gives you some base to work with. Go ahead. Here you are with the finished product. In the, in the right hand, you can see the flock or the, uh, the branch that I use, the plastic branch. And here I try to model like the redwoods. Uh, it may not look like a redwood to some people, but to me, it looks good enough for a redwood. <laughs> <laughs> and I got the deers on the bottom to show you it looks like. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> I think your comment uh, on this particular one, Pat, is uh, there's detail added to the bottom of the tree to help blend it in. In some of my trees, I've taken a hot glue gun and I'll squirt some material right on the bottom edge of it and draw it out so it looks like a, a branch coming up out of the ground or into the ground. It's a simple way of doing it. I like simple. I mean, you can get complicated by adding other pieces of wood or using uh, putty a type of putty that uh, can, can form on there. There's many different ways you can do it, but this is simple, cheap, easy. I may go back and change it later. Who knows? <laughs> now, sure, that I picked up in one of the comeback books probably 20, 25 years ago was to use a uh, plumber putty. And the other thing, going back to a, uh, one of our themes that runs through this is taking your tips and hints from nature. If you go out for a walk and uh, watching where you're going, just periodically look down at the ground. One of the things you'll notice is that root structure doesn't always break the ground immediately around a tree, um, often depending on the underlying uh, subsoil or rock. Uh, you'll find uh, coniferous trees, sometimes deciduous as well, sending out roots that break the ground some distance away. So again, a nice way in the foreground to add some variety and interest to your scenery and it breaks the uniformity. And of course, it's much closer to the real thing, nature. That's right. So here's, um, an, well, here's another yeah. close up of, <laughs> uh, of this. Anyway, um... If we're looking at this here, we can see at the bottom photo, a uh, closer look at that uh, glue gun I put on there. And then the plumber's putty can be used too. Uh, I just leave it up to the individual. It, it, it depends on what, how, how pronounced they want to make it. Uh, the plastic armatures, you can see how they're planted into the tree and how I shape them by cutting them on an edge, uh, on an angle. It isn't all uh, flared out in one size. In, in this case, one size does not fit all. <laughs> anyway, um, I use these for a foreground tree and a few as I go up the side of the mountain and then I get, gradually get smaller. Another thing too is you're modeling a tree. It's a model in itself. And uh, a scale is another story. If you get it to scale, it becomes humongous because some of these trees are huge to begin with in diameter. And that's just something I wanted to put in there because, you know, a lot of trees, if you were doing it to scale, exact scale, it would look weird. I mean, it would look so big on a layout. Anyway, moving along. 
dead branches. Oh, yeah, somebody just asked about dead branches. I just use some of the stems that uh, come off the caspi and stick them in there. And, and I'll uh, I'll dig up and dry out just roots in the garden. Yeah. I also back onto a farm field and uh, I, I sift through that with uh, that dirt with um, various uh, sort of dimensions or uh, courses of uh, tea strainers uh, mm -hmm. purchased at the dollar store. And all the debris that's left over, it goes into a yogurt container and uh, again, worked in, glued down, and then other materials spread around it. It's great for simulating uh, again, roots, down branches, all sorts of stuff. Yep. Okay. So this is a picture from Pat's layout that just, again, sort of pulls together some of the different materials that are available to us. Um, our emphasis is on uh, do-it-yourself build, but uh, here's two examples that you can see of uh, Bragdon Enterprise preserved fern trees. Also down here on the uh, left, is a kind of a bottle brush tree. Pat, I think you said you recycled this from a Christmas tree. Not that one in particular, but I'll show you one later on. Oh, and, uh... okay. All right. But here's <laughs> another, this is just sort of a simple bottle brush tree. And yeah. again, we've seen articles on how you make them out of uh, twisted wire and um, uh, twine, um, or you can just buy them. Uh, but the, sort of going back to the theme that Gary was talking about in his talk, uh, very little gets thrown out in the household of a <laughs> typical modeler. Um, and here again, uh, notice the different textures, shapes, forms um, that the different techniques can provide. There is that Christmas tree one. Oh, this is it here. Yes. Yep. <laughs> I found that along the side of the road. <laughs> recycle. I said, I'm going to try that just for the heck of it. So I brought it home. I only did a few of them and I said, that's enough for me. That, that wire was so hard to cut. It was unbelievable. <laughs> but I trimmed, a, I trimmed them a little bit and then I sprinkled on the usual foam and some fiber and stuff like that. They didn't turn out too bad. So there you have it from the horse's mouth. <laughs> yeah. Those who know you would never suspect that you're a disciple of the three R's. We <laughs> use recycle. That's right. Another great shot showing the variety. And notice, um, uh, if it's not in this one, it may be in the next uh, picture, uh, you'll see some trees that are very, very sparse. And again, you'll go out, you'll take a photograph of a scene. Initially, all you'll see will be foliage. And later on, when you get at home, you'll look at it and you realize, yes, here's the one. Um, you'll see that there's a tree standing in the forest and standing in a woodlot that essentially is a, a soldier standing dead, uh, very few leaves on it at this time of year. So we tend to emphasize too much sameness, it seems to me, uh, in a lot of the things that we model, at least where we're trying to create scenes like this. And if you've taken away anything from this presentation today, it would be variety. Pat, some wrap up comments from you. Uh, and one thing I would like to hope that this would uh, help people to try and model a tree yourself and once you get into it you'll find it a lot more uh, re, uh pleasurable i've seen me do it in front of the tv and my card table set up uh, my junk in front of me and i start planting all the branches into the trunks that i've already done um it's uh one thing you got to do is a volume if you're going to do a volume of trees it would cost you a fortune to go out and buy these things uh, i like to do it cheaply and this is the cheapest way i found to do it i try to strive in realism i don't know how realistic it is to some people but to me it looks good enough and it helps in the hobby just to give you some time to work at it to not just lay track and build cars you build trees and you'll find out it's a different story <laughs> In the last page, we're going to show you the uh, different sources. Uh, I'm not going to try and pronounce those names because I'm pretty bad at it. <laughs> but there are some there if you want to look at them and write them down. Um, and Gordon Gravitt has uh, all about conifers. There's uh, one by uh, William Mike for Eastern type North American trees. And that graining tool, hey. Greatest tool I ever had. It would work for HO scale if you just didn't press so hard. That's all. But it <laughs> is a great, you know, otherwise you'll go right on through it. Anyway, you can get that at Michael's or any uh, any florist shop. 
I found a floor shop. You could ask them for one of those because they use them in the bottom of their their uh, their vases to hold the plants or the, the flowers in. Yeah. It, it, it's all made of lead and, and I think those are nails. They look like finishing nails in the lead. And if you're going to get the spray, get the good spray. I used cheap stuff and all the stuff fell off after. It was cheap from dollar store, no good for nothing. So I just went on and bought some real expensive stuff and it's been there for 10 years now and hasn't moved an inch. You get the good stuff, uh, you, you could also go out in a strong wind with it and your hair won't much, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Just make sure it's unscented or you'll smell like a beauty salon. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think that pretty well covers everything. I hope you enjoyed it. If there's any questions, we'll try and answer them. We'll try. <laughs> uh, I have one. I, I think you touched on it. The manufacturers, when they make trees, they make them a lot smaller than the scale requires. I mean, if you went to scale, obviously, oh, like a, a tree would probably be twice the size or two and a half times the size of a house. <laughs> um, I do a lot of uh, the trees like you're doing that are in the Rockies and so on. Mm -hmm. I use broom handle. Yeah, and I'm modeling, I'm modeling an HO and, and even those are not tall enough. I saw one on an internet on YouTube. This guy did it to scale for O yeah. scale. Mm -hmm. And they were so big that he had the trunk going up and he had the, you know, the limbs on it and he had the top cut off because he couldn't go any further. It was right. the ceiling. Right. <laughs> and that's I, think the, I think the phrase from our hobby is selective compression. Um, yes. A lot of what I have structure wise on my layout are industrial and I mean, everything that Pat has said about scale and overpowering the layout. I mean, at the end of the day, um, it, it is the train running through the environment. And uh, I think it all has to be um, appropriately scaled. That's right. And if you can't find that florist tool, uh, they make a brush for cleaning your files. It's called a, a card file. Mm -hmm. it's great for texturing wood. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I try to stay away from balsa because no matter what you use, if anything with a wire brush or like that, it, it just shreds the balsa. So I, I use basswood at, at the, the, the softest wood I use, mm -hmm. but the card file is great. Mm -hmm. so, so just as a side, this is a link um, in it's in the chat for, one of those two and a quarter inch diameter. There's also one for three smaller ones for 12 bucks on Amazon. Oh, wow. Wow. So it's those, nice those, are in, those are in the chat. And also, by the way, the tree resources is in the chat as an image. So if you grab that and pull that down, you can print it out and have it. It'll be in the YouTube video. Thanks, Phil. Super. Thanks. I, I posted a couple of links to a guy named Boomer Dioramas. Yeah, And both of them, he does uh, BC or Oregon um, type trees. He worked in a museum. I think he also was working in O-Scale in the um, uh, Granville Island Marine Museum. They had an O-Scale uh, layout there. I saw that. And his trees were like six foot tall. Yeah, <laughs> amazing though. He did a great job on them. <laughs> yeah. But he shows how he did call, it. Sorry. For those on this call that aren't modeling the Rockies, um, mm. I model the Niagara Peninsula. Um, most of the conifers um, in the right of way areas, for example, and uh, in the distant, the backdrop, they're probably no more than 30 feet high. Uh, and a lot of them are pretty uh, scruffy looking because uh, certain, particularly cedars, will often be growing where their feet are wet. Um, so they're not too healthy. Um, so if you're in places where the terrain, the scenery is not as dramatic as the Rockies, um, you can use the same technique. Again, take your uh, hints from nature. And if you can't get to where you're modeling, uh, use the power of Google. Exactly. Just remember, this is not gospel. So you can do it any way you want, as long as, long as it satisfies you. That's the main thing. It's my railroad. That's right. 
at your rear. And thank you for the additional <laughs> tips. Yes, very much. Anyway, we hope you people got some something out of it. And uh, maybe you'll go out and try and model a tree. Once you've done one or two, it gets addicting. <laughs> I find it it's nice to break away from the other part of the hobby, doing, doing something different like that. Pat, let me ask you a question. Paul, you too. What's the, uh, what's the one thing that I need to look out for? I've never made a tree before, so I'm going to try to make some now. What do I Carve need to look from yourself? What did you say, Paul? Carve <laughs> away from yourself. That's right. <laughs> don't cut your fingers all up. And I don't, don't want to see you with any band-aids at the next show either. <laughs> <laughs> and don't be your own worst critic. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Practice. Makes perfect. <laughs> yes. Well, thanks so much, guys. I, I think this was a great presentation. I've been looking forward to this because I've, I've heard some great things about uh, the trees that both of you make. Uh, but I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much for both of you. Thank you, Jim. You're very welcome.